Welcome, everyone. I'm Carl Ford. I am your moderator today. Uh, I'm joined by a wonderful panel of Dan Warren from GSMA, Manuel Vexler from Huawei, Stefan Stenson from Ericsson, and Gang Wu from Intel, plus, our, of course, our host and the guy who uh, knows how to run Scopia, uh, Anatoly Levine, who is uh, hiding in the background pushing the slides for us all right now. Uh, I want to talk real quick about the logistics of this event. First of all, it's recorded, so you'll be able to uh, see a uh, copy of this going forward in about, uh, well, almost immediately, um, but let's say within 24 hours. If you have questions, please use the Twitter account or the Skype chat at IMTC.org, O-R-G. And um, the presentation is up on this link if you want to go there and um, look at it from SlideShare. Uh, I also want to say to you that uh, this is kind of an important uh, discussion for a couple of reasons. One of the major ones is that, that um, we can think of uh, voice over LTE as kind of the canary in the coal mine. When we fully implement voice over LTE, we've truly reached the tipping point where the evolved packet core is dominating our communications network. And it's important for us to keep paying attention to where we're going. Where we're going. There's an effort in the U.S. to, uh, to have the death of POTS. And uh, when we see the fact that um, even wireless has gotten to the point where it's using the evolved packet core uh, for voice, it's obvious time to uh, look for better quality on voice and video. And I'm hoping to hear this part of the conversation. Um, the last thing I want to say to you is that, uh, uh, unfortunately, Dan has to run away from us, so I'm going to start him off in the presentations, and then I'm going to s stop and let some questions come around, and then we will continue with the rest of the conversation, and we will have those questions at the end. So without further ado, Dan, let me get you started. Thanks, Carl. So if we move on to... Uh to my first slide, we can move straight past that one. So um, I think the requirement which I was presented with on this webinar was to give um, an idea of uh, where we are today and what's going to come next. So just to give you a, a quick recap of where we came from and how we got to where we are on Voice over LTE, originally there was a, a profile called One Voice, which was defined by uh, six operators and six vendors. Um, that was published in November 2009, uh, and then it essentially was, was looking for a home. Um, and in looking for a home, uh, two choices were naturally presented. One was GSMA and the other was 3GPP. And it was decided that GSMA should take this forward and, and from that came the, the voice over LTE work. So we spent a lot of time over the last two years writing um, a bunch of specifications. Perhaps the, the best known is IR92, which is the uh, user network interface definition for a SIP profile for voice over LTE which builds on 3GPP MMTEL. But then since then, we've looked at things like interconnect and roaming. Most of that work now is done. Um, the, the last piece of, if you like, dotting the I's and crossing the T's is the roaming architecture, which uh, we found we had a couple of additional uh, commercial requirements that fell out of the work, which we started on that, um, which resulted in us needing to go back to 3GPP. So we've got around that block. Uh, there is a Ravel work item in 3GPP right now, which once that's completed, will finish the technical definitions. Um, and from that point onwards, um, everything going forward is about implementation uh, and realization of voice over LTE as a service. So if we move on to the next slide. Right now, um, we're expecting to see first voice over LTE deployments sometime either late 2011 or early in 2012. And uh, with the best will in the world, I'm suspecting it'll probably be 2012 right now. Um, the implementations that we're seeing, um, the voice over LTE definition as it stands defines the absolute bare minimum uh, of what was, what's required for, for voice over LTE. So uh, narrowband codec, and the, the basic default sets of functionality. But the good news is that everybody who is um, implementing seems to be moving forward with some of the enhancements that can be done on top. And for those of you who are of a technical mind, you'll know that um, SIP as a protocol and within that session description protocol allows additional functionality to be negotiated in or out of the session on a, on a per session basis. So 
things like wideband codec usage, things like uh, video, uh, additional functionality like rich communication suite is all coming along on the basis of voice over LTE becoming a live service. In the meantime, um, European and Asian operators are still tending towards um, CS fullback, and, and we think that part of the reason of that is there's quite a lot of complexity around uh, a piece of functionality called single radio voice call continuity, um, which is the mechanism for handing a voice over LTE call back down into 2G and 3G and back into the circuit switch domain. Uh, and that seems to be proving a little bit more troublesome than people thought. The good news from the bigger perspective is that ultimately everybody is heading towards voice over LTE. Um, and like I say, it's just that people are choosing different paths to get there. So the focus of the work now that we're completing GSMA has moved on beyond the original voice over LTE technical definitions and we're looking at uh, a number of enhancements and there's a bunch of spec numbers on your screens now but I'll take a little moment to, to look at each one of the, the additional parts in detail. So if we move on to the next slide again. The, the first one is um, this IMS control for all voice calls. So this is made up of two elements. Um, the lower one is single radio voice call continuity again, and uh, there are elements within that which have commercial knock-on effects. So if I'm on a call which is voice over LTE controlled, uh, and I want to do a handover back into 2G or 3G, then the IMS needs to remain in control of, uh, of that call. Um, and not only is there a technical requirement there, but it also means that there needs to be tethering together of the billing records associated with what amounts as a PS call to start with and then hands over into a CS call so that you don't essentially get call charged a, a double call origination or call termination fee uh, and the billing records are all mapped together. The upper one is, uh, is access to main selection function. So if a call is made into a voice over LTE subscriber, there needs to be a decision made about how that voice call is routed. And it, it's fairly straightforward because they're either in LTE um, coverage or they're not. But because the LTE coverage has a certain implication around it to do with IMS, IMS needs to make that decision. So within IR64, we're uh, defining how both of these pieces of functionality work moving forward. We move on to the next one. So the next one is um, video LTE. And uh, one of the great things about the way that voice over LTE has been defined, um, it sets a framework which is based on um, the MMTEL principles. As a result, it sets a template for uh, applying additional services to on the basis of MMTEL. So, if you uh, if you need a, a really interesting read on evening, um, you can pick up the latest version of IR94, which is available on the GSMA webpage, and have a read of that. But what you'll find is that a lot of it refers back to IR92 because the um, functionality is pretty much the same. The only things which are changing are the the usage of some of the SDP. Um, lines within the offer answer to include um, a video codec instead of just a voice one. So to, to do that, you need to be able to apply all of the great things that, uh, that um, uh, MMTEL prescribes, so supplementary services um, like multi-party, there's also integration back into existing video conferencing systems. Um, and then perhaps one of the more interesting parts is early media. So the idea that instead of just getting a ringtone or an indication of, um, of the person that you're calling's phone number on the screen in front of you when they ring, you have the potential to actually play out a piece of early media so that there may be a, a short video stab which is played onto the person who you're ringing's phone. If we move on to the next one. Um, so IR92 um, defines how voice over LTE works, but one of the things which has been pointed out is that essentially when you move, um, when you, one of the things which drives the IR92 is the fact that there is no CS domain, but the other thing is that you have an awful lot of bandwidth there which you can use to apply additional voice services on top of the services which you have already. So why wouldn't you use all of that? Why wouldn't you use all of that definition on other broadband accesses? And the one which lends itself most readily from the perspective of GSMA, at least, is to also use an IMS profile for voice and SMS over HSPA. So the illustration on the right-hand side here shows you the, the sum total of what's defined in IR58. You have all the same IMS features, all the same media, all the same bearer management and other functionalities. And the only thing which really changes is the radio capabilities from LTE to HSPA. 
So this again is a, is a fairly thin specification. It makes a lot of reference into IR92. And then the result is that all you really end up with is a, a, the absolute specifics of what the radio technology is that you're connecting across um, as the, the difference between the two. So if we move on to the next one. Um, so proving how it works, um, and I guess part of the reason why I'm invited onto the, the call today is that there has been a, um, a definitely a positive exercise that took place in May 2011 uh, with the IMTC who ran a, an event which they call SuperOp to do uh, interoperability um, between uh, the, the networks and the devices. It did struggle slightly um, on the basis of a, a lack of handsets, um, but we think that that's coming on strong soon. Um, and the IMTC is hosting a voiceover LT webinar, which you're all sitting here listening to. You may have guessed these slides have been used a number of times. The other thing which we've done uh, was the MSF voiceover LT interoperability event um, in September 2011. Uh, it was hosted by Vodafone and China Mobile within their labs, so the Vodafone lab in Düsseldorf and China Mobile's lab in Beijing. And what they were looking at more was the network equipment side of, uh, of the definition. So they demonstrated calls, they demonstrated interconnect, and they demonstrated roaming. Um, they put their results out on the 8th of November, um, and they are going to be speaking about those results in an event in London in two weeks' time. Um, they have plans to do further IoT testing, um, and that's going to go across a whole bunch of things, voice over LTE, RCS, um, and co-hosted with, uh, with Etsy, and again, is backed by the GSMA. So I think um, one of the things that you're going to see as we move forward through, throughout 2012 is, is the kind of theory turning into reality side of uh, everything which is going on in voice over LTE. With it, we've had an awful lot talking about the, the technology. We've done a lot of standards definition. Where we're getting to now is um, beginning to develop that maturity and understanding of what it takes to put a network and a device together to not just build a single voice over LTE network, but actually to build an entire ecosystem. Um, and it's that ecosystem which is essential to the overall success of voice over LTE. It needs to be something equivalent to the, the mobile technology ecosystem which is out there today. Um, GSM has the, is been the basis of that to a certain extent. CDMA has been um, a parallel system. When we get to LTE, we're going to have one big happy family on, the, on a, a global um, business and technology platform. Uh, and the voice implementation needs to be something which has that same ecosystem feel about it. So I think that's probably my last slide, if you move on. Yep, there we go. Um, I've seen, Carl, that you've been pumping questions across. I'm, I'm happy to ask, answer pretty much anything. <laughs> Excellent. That's, uh, I'm glad to hear that because uh, I have a few. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I haven't seen anything yet on, uh, on the Skype side. I'll remind people that uh, IMPC.org is the place to send questions both on Twitter and on Skype. Uh, and, Dan, let me start with... Uh, uh, a an interesting question. Right now, we have a lot of trans uh, transmediation going on, but uh, where we have a lot of different um, uh, codecs being modified and managed in uh, dealing with the network. Is your expectation that we're going to standardize codecs and in effect the need for transmediation declines as a result of voice over LTE? Or are you expecting that we're going to have so many different standards involved in, in the codex that we're actually going to still need the transmediation? So the, the approach that we took with the, the definition of voice over LTE was to define the local meter. So the, the least minimal set which is, uh, which is required to put a service in place which is equivalent to that today. And one of the things that we did in that was to identify default codecs. Um, and default codecs give you two things. The first thing is they, they, they give you a guaranteed baseline um, um, uh, functional set, um, which in this case has to be narrowband because we don't want to make, um, make people who don't want to implement wideband um, go and do it from day one. Um, but the second thing it does is it means that you, you're guaranteed there is always going to be a codec there to establish a call with which means that there should be no reason for any call to have to go through a transcoder. So as a bare minimum, everybody should support AMR. Um, on that basis, any call can be established using AMR between any two endpoints, and there should be no need for, for a codec. If you find both sides support a wideband codec, then use it. And I can see there's a, there's a question 
Just from Daniel, which is related to that. Yeah, from, from uh, Daniel Berninger, which says about obstacles supporting AMR wideband HD voice over LTE. There are no obstacles um, by the implementation of the, of the codec itself. Um, essentially, you just identify it in the, in the SDP line as something that, that one side of a call supports. Um, and if the other side supports it too, that will come back in the answer part of a SDP offer answer, and you can establish a call using AMR wideband, assuming that you have enough bandwidth to do that. And if you're on LTE access, you're going to have enough bandwidth to do that. Okay, so, so let me ask that, that Wi-Fi question to you too. So EPDG is a, is a protocol that's being run for the Wi-Fi community to uh, basically enable it so that the, um, the wireless carriers can front-end Wi-Fi networks and use them like they're using them for offload. And in effect, it would enable managed services and that kind of stuff. Is our expectation that, that uh, as we do voice over LTE that we really aren't going to pay attention necessarily to where the call is coming into and, and will we be able to uh, take advantage of that to make it so that there's some uh, wideband codecs associated with uh, voice over Wi-Fi that's connecting up seamlessly to the carrier? Um, I, think, I think as we move forward, uh, the, the consumer is going to demand that the, the specifics of the access network and the access technology are almost hidden from them. Um, and I think there's a number of things which are taking place right now to allow that to take place. And they are all around Wi-Fi offload, Wi-Fi roaming, um, some of the stuff which has come out of the WFA on, on 802.1x, some of the hotspot 2.0 stuff. All of that kind of is moving in the same direction of saying, you know, what, you, you have a device, you're going to be using it indoors and outdoors. It's going to need to be able to attach to whatever technology is going to offer you the best level of connectivity at any time. And I think the next step beyond that is to say, you know what, it's all a, an IP bearer. And, and essentially, the kind of the idea of over-the-top services um, is going to go away and die um, because everything runs over the top of something now. You have a baseline IP connectivity, um, which is going to run not just from consumer to network, but also between networks themselves. Um, and so everything is just protocol stack on top of that. And so rather than being over the top in the in the traditional sense that, that people refer to that it's more a question of the level of uh, integration into the operator's network so if people have got Wi-Fi access into their, their traditional MNO services then yeah why not why not run voice over Wi-Fi using exactly the same IMS stack it's only the same principle as the voice over HSPA stuff we've done and the point about IMS is um, that it was built from day one to be access agnostic it's kind of ironic that the biggest IMS deployments right now are in the fixed line network um, when it was a, a originally a mobile defined standard. Um, but essentially, there isn't a huge amount of, uh, of access specific stuff within the, uh, the IMS domain. So you, as long as you can reach the IMS and you can authenticate to it, you can access any of your services which are in the IMS domain over any access you like. Yeah, I, it, that is irony. and. and um, we should have a whole other conversation about that, which we will in Miami. Um, but let's let's do Dan's follow-up question. Are there costs in an HD voice call that a standard definition could not suffer? Um, I don't think so. Um, I mean, uh, there's probably a license cost for supporting the, the AMR wideband codec, but one of the initiatives which we've been driving in the GSMA alongside Voice Over LTE is a, um, an HD voice ready logo, uh, basically a service mark which says, from a device and a network perspective that the HD voice and AMR wideband is enabled. So my, my perspective and my understanding is that this is something which is going to be um, pervasive into the network at such a level that, that scale drives cost down to the bare minimum. Um, and it needs to be something which is a, a globally accepted standard of its, in its own right. AMR wideband has been defined in, uh, in 3GPP for some time, so I think the thing which has been limiting its adoption has been availability of bandwidth on the bearer rather than the, the cost of the implementation itself. Okay, so let me ask you this question then. Um, if, we, uh, if, if we don't see any extra cost, should we consider it that it's going to be deployed as an enhanced service, or do you think that uh, it will be a service associated with specific carriers in their rollouts. Do we expect that, um, you know, you, you've been blessed uh, 
Dan, in the fact that you haven't been subject to some of the state's commercials. You know, there was a there was a point where Whitney Houston's voice was being used to uh, to offer a quote better quality service, and all they did was uh, in effect increase the base on the uh, on the network. Uh, the question I, I think I'm asking is, should we expect that the carriers are going to try to differentiate themselves, or do you think that they're going to try to create differentiated services? I think I think there's a there's a window um, for differentiation on the basis of availability of high definition, but the, the thing about high definition is that you know it has to be supported on both ends to, to, to you know, fit on the call, um, and as a result, that naturally lends itself to uh, the need for a high definition codec to be supported ubiquitously for everybody to get that value. So my my expectation is that. There may be a window there, um, it'll be relatively short, and then it will become table stakes. It'll be something that you have to do, otherwise you are you're a have not rather than you do it as an option to be a have. Um, and so my expectation is that over time we see HD voice become the baseline standard. The fact that we haven't defined it within uh, within voice over LTE as a, as a default codec is really because, um, because we wanted it to be something which was absolute bare minimum because we need to take a global view of this rather than something which um, which is specific to market. So from a global perspective, we don't want any kind of additional bells and whistles to become a barrier of entry on the basis of uh, price, cost, or, or maturity of technology. But my expectation is that um, high definition voice becomes the default for, for a voice over LTE implementation. Great. Dan, it looks like we're going to give you five minutes to spare for, before your next call. So we want to thank you again for your time. And, uh, with, that, and with that said, let's uh, move on to Manuel. And uh, Manuel, are you there? Yes, I am here. And uh, um, good morning, good afternoon, whatever the case is. Uh, let me jump right in. And, and uh, Carl, uh, hopefully you can hear me OK. I hear you fine. Um, so I title actually intentionally my presentation voice over LTE and SMS over LTE because the way I understand voice over LTE uh, as a migration uh, path is really the effort to turn off the circuit switch network uh, in mobile. And that uh, makes us uh, uh, or, or forces us to think of all the services we carry over the TS not only the uh, the voice. Also, um, uh, I want to take an approach uh, which goes end-to-end. -end. Um, as, as you know, Huawei is a um, vendor which has uh, all the portfolio from terminals all the way to IMS and core networks, mobile networks, and so on. So um, moving to slide, uh, to, um, uh, to the first slide, uh, I think you have seen this forecast before. Um, mobile operators are still betting the uh, next four or five years growth on, uh, on uh, or, or at least revenues, core revenues on voice. Um, and this bet, it's, uh, a, and this forecast is based on the, the fact that uh, we expect the consumer demand to, to continue to grow. Uh, if we look worldwide, we are uh, in many countries who are uh, very close to the saturation point, actually, in deploying voice mobile technologies. That includes also countries uh, um, uh, underdeveloped or in uh, in uh, early stage of development. Uh, if we move, um, if we look on the bottom slide of the slide of the chart, however, and if we look at the U.S. market uh, in the last year, we can see actually a decrease in voice usage in mobile networks. That decrease is about seven to eight percent year over year. Uh, so we see a decrease of voice traffic at the expense of SMS traffic of text and uh, Twitter. So in planning the voice over LTE strategy, uh, I definitely uh, ask, and uh, and uh, I think we should work very closely with GSMA, 3GPP, IMTC to factor in all the services we deliver over the circuit network, and SMS is a key one. Um, moving next to, to the next slide. Um, now, I think Dan already touched a little bit on the uh, prospects for 2012, 2015. I brought a little bit more data about those. Um, uh, and uh, 
Uh, if we look at uh, LTE in the US, it's being pushed extremely aggressively by Verizon. I expect the same pattern to be seen with other CDMA, uh, large CDMA providers, which uh, they decided to use LTE as the 4G technology. Uh, and uh, that obviously poses a different challenge to the migration uh, from circuit switch to, uh, from CS to uh, voice over LTE. Uh, other vendors, AT&T, uh, a follower in the U.S. for LTE. They, they have uh, four or five regions at the moment. Uh, they launched the service in Dallas, for instance. I check it there. I have an LTE phone now. And I've seen uh, speeds up to 10 megabits per second. So uh, just as a footnote, that opens an opportunity for over the top, such as Skype, to compete with voice over LTE, both in qu uh, quality as well as in functionality. Remi remind, a um, couple of reminders, Skype is now part of Microsoft. They also offer not only voice over LTE, they're also offering multi-party conferencing with audio and video capabilities and so on. Uh, Docomo, uh, again, an, uh, an aggressive and early uh, adopter of LTE, as in general adopter of new technologies. And last but not least, Deutsche Telekom in Germany uh, with, um, with um, CS uh, um, uh, fallback as a, as a strategy. Um, if we look at the operator's plans, we see uh, uh, 128 LTE networks commitments in 52 countries. So LTE is definitely here. The question is when voice, when the uh, circuit switch network will be uh, turned off and voice over LTE, voice over broadband becomes the, uh, the technology of choice for voice. Next slide, please. Uh, on the, uh, the most important factor in the migration to voice over LTE, of course, is the capabilities of the terminals. Just second to actually the deployment uh, of, uh, of the uh, LTE uh, radio capabilities. I think we need to go a couple of slides back. To the fast developing ecosystem. Um, we're, measuring very, we're measuring very carefully the amount of uh, uh, the, the uh, evolution of the devices. We see the voice over LTE uh, actually uh, being uh, now available in uh, uh, handsets from uh, um, uh, the uh, Android side, and uh, we can see that we can see that uh, uh, that evolution uh, happening very quickly. Uh, I'm looking particularly at the U.S. market. We've seen a, a number of vendors offering LTE terminals in uh, uh, for Verizon and now AT&T. Uh, I think, uh, and I'm hoping that we'll see soon announcement from, uh, from the Apple camp. So the Android camp is already in, in that area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the proposal and Huawei strategy is to take a, a, a phased approach. I've seen this strategy actually shared with many of the participants in the LTE market. Uh, and um, um, what I am predicting is that the voice over LTE opportunity will start actually earlier uh, than uh, maybe some of the analysts are predicting. The reason for that is that uh, first thing, the terminals are enabled to uh, to carry uh, to, uh, the terminals are uh, enabled to uh, have uh, SIP clients, uh, to have uh, VOBB clients like Skype. So that pushes, uh, puts pressure on uh, operators to offer more functionality. Uh, as a result, and I think that's, uh, that's important for the IMTC as well, we need to focus uh, a lot on, on uh, not only testing the capability, the basic cap capabilities of voice in voice over LTE, but uh, making sure that in our uh, tests for interoperability, we factor in uh, the requirements for the market for uh, high quality voice, uh, for voice features such as uh, uh, voice conferencing, as well as, well as mixing media, much, uh, such as uh, uh, video conferencing. So I don't see the voice over LTE as being a market which uh, it's a standalone market anymore. 
as soon as we move to LT, as soon as we move to uh, um, 4G technologies with uh, large capacity in the network, we are opening actually the uh, market for the triple and quadruple uh, for the triple play on the mobile side. So voice, video, and high-speed internet access become really a, a reality. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, um, solution from uh, from Huawei it's actually um, made of uh, of the three components. Um, as I said, I'm taking an end-to-end -end approach to, to today's presentation. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, diversity of terminals has to be uh, factored in because we are dealing with consumer markets. We're dealing with different price points, with different uh, acceptance levels, different education levels. So uh, the diversity in terminals has to be um, matched with actually keeping the network as simple as possible, as homogeneous as possible. So our strategy in Huawei is while we diversify in the terminals and consumer devices and enterprise devices, we uh, streamline the network, and our strategies are uh, around the single core, single uh, EPC, and uh, um, combining the databases for mobility uh, and uh, functionalities, um, that typically IMS. Uh, so we're looking at, at single HSS and so on for the uh, for the strategy. Uh, last and uh, definitely not least, uh, enriching the user experience past the circuit switch voice, it's mandatory. Uh, we're looking, and, and I've seen in uh, our presentations, we're looking at the challenges from a technology voice, uh, technology and migration viewpoint, but really from a consumer viewpoint, this is transparent. This, this is not, uh, it's not going to be advertised. What needs to be changed is the approach to the way, uh, the quality we deliver voice, the services we deliver with voice, and as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, we should definitely look at text, SMS, and so on. It's not enough to look at the VOLT migration, but we need to look at the circuit switch to um, uh, all IP networks with IMS and 4G technologies uh, uh, and, and Wi-Fi technologies actually uh, integrated, as, as Dan has mentioned in, in his presentation. Next slide, please. Uh, so summarizing, uh, keeping simple the uh, uh, the uh, migration and keeping simple the core network, we're looking uh, to uh, to uh, make it easy to deploy, and definitely, and I I cannot stress enough, uh, enriching the user experience is critical. As I showed on my first slide, voice. Uh, in mobile network, it's following the same path in, as voice in circuit switch network. People use less voice, more text, more multimedia, more Facebook, more Skype, Twitter, and so on. Uh, thank you, Carl. I'm ready for questions. Carl, I cannot hear you. Carl, you muted yourself. So what I said, Anatoly, is, uh, Manuel, is I wanted to make it so that we uh, we ask these questions towards the end and, and we move on to Stefan. Um, so uh, we've got a question about silicon, which I think uh, it'll be better if the panel a answers. So let's hold off that question and let's move on to Stefan. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Can you all hear me? Yes, you're fine. Okay. Thank you. So I'm Stefan Svensson from, from Ericsson. I'll share some, some uh, uh, Volt insights and perspective from an Ericsson po uh, point of view. So moving on, first slide, if you can skip, please. Um, Volta happening now, that, and, and uh, the, let me describe a little bit around the momentum we, we, uh, we see and, and uh, some, some uh, basic uh, fact that's re really leading us to this conclusion. Um, operators planning then, uh, and I think we, we, uh, we share the views earlier on, said that they will, will start coming launches during then next year, 2012, and uh, very much driven from uh, North America and Ericsson being part of, of the, uh, the uh, installations then in, in, in North America, seeing a very good and the next phase, it will be followed by, 
by uh, Europe and, and uh, Asia, but the, the uh, need for CS coexistence functionality is, is slowing a little bit down in, in, in Europe. Um, we have, as, as the second point, uh, IODT, IoT is starting to happen with uh, good proofs. We're starting to look at, at IoT for the radio parts, for the IMS application parts. And, and also tying it together then for the, for the total stack in, in, in towards the, uh, uh, network, combining networks and terminals. Um, we have seen good progress when it comes to, to network vendors providing product solution and the functionality as specified in the Vault profile is being released into commercial, uh, products. We have the, the, uh, uh, optimized VoIP beers available. We have the IMS systems, so it's 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 really then then coming into to a phase where we can see that that materializing in commercial uh, solution, both then on 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 device side and chipset side and and uh, on network side. And good proof is 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 CS fallback being rolled out as we speak, and then the next phase being being Volt the rollouts during next year. And LTE uh, being then deployed on on very relevant uh, frequencies for voice for doing voice uh, in the US with the 700 bands in in Europe with the 800 bands give, giving the the right coverage and and really see, really see that coverage is, is is key for for having a good service and and with these bands available and being launched that's really a, a, a good basis for launching services. And LTE and the pace that we see LTE be, being rolled out, it's, it's really superseding what has happened before on, on 2G, 3G side. So it really gets, gives uh, good hope of, of fast transition and fast introduction. So, so I think these are five strong points for, for Volta happening in the timelines that we, we speak, starting them from, from basically next year and onwards. Uh, moving on then to, to next slide, please. Um, when it comes then to, to the foundation for, for doing Vault, it's very much about uh, catering for service evolution. And the best way, as we see, for, for um, serving uh, service evolution is, is, is then to see that you have a good foundation of continuous package coverage where you can really uh, use a number of capabilities in, in, in the network and spread it to a number of devices. Communication in an all IP environment, adding on, we have spoken about HD voice and video capabilities, further multimedia services, presence, etc. And specifically, if we, if we look at, at, at video, we, with then the, the um, initial uh, Volta profile, the IR92, and then coming to, to the add-on IR94, uh, adding then possibilities to do ad hoc video conferencing, etc. We, we see a, a very good interest to add on video and, and even, uh, a lot of, of operators looking to, to do video as, as a day one service, adding them to, to the, uh, to, to the voice and the Volta services. So, it is is then then of course not stopping with 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 these services, but it it's it's a multitude of possibilities when it comes to adding then support for different type of accesses, having multiple devices, etc. But all this framed into to to more of the the uh, uh, technology legacy of telephony, well, still being then reachable for everyone being able to contact everyone. So there's a lot of, of, of good legacies to bring into this service evolution, and that's really what we see uh, Volta doing for the future. Moving on to the next slide, uh, talking about end-to-end um, -end approach, and, and we can't emphasize this, this enough when it, when it comes to, to, to looking at the, the, uh, the value of, of uh, uh, keeping them together, the full chain of the stack, all from the application to the, the packet core access all, all the way to, towards the device. Uh, we are working t uh, throughout, of course, the, the, the full stack, have, having matured the solution from doing 
initial fun functional uh, test to gradually coming into more and more of the, the service quality, the capacity aspects, etc. And focusing then on, on aspects uh, of uh, voice quality, service quality, uh, the goal has, has then been and, and is to, to uh, be able to offer at least the same, same or better service as you have, would have on, on 2G, 3G when it comes to, or to um, voice quality, etc. And really what, where we are and when it comes to, to, to proving that is, is that it's, it's really showing good quality. We, we are basing that kind of statement on, on um, tests done first then in labs, but also then in, in commercial networks at field, field tests. So if we look at the, the, some of the main uh, key performance indicators uh, for doing Volta when it comes to speech quality uh, and to, to the upper right in this chart, there's uh, a graph indicating then speech pass delay, which is one, one of the critical uh, measurements in, in order to follow up the, uh, uh, the voice quality. And this is on one side measured in lab, but also in, in, in field tests. But if we, we look at the, the charts we have on, on, on the green and, and orange parts, then when uh, the, the um, transport delays, the, the coding, decoding parts, um, which, which, which is, is, is then really showing a good, good and healthy low uh, contribution to the speech path delays. And of course, there is a, also an ad ad additional part generated from 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 the device. And as we we already uh, at at the level around a little bit more than 200 millisecond, but as we we more and more mature devices and coming into to uh, to um, a commercial deployment, wide, wider scale deployment, we're very confident that we will see more and more optimization in, in the devices to bring this down to, to below 200 and, and really ensuring good quality on, on when it comes to, to the delay aspects. Another uh, vital part when it comes to, to quality is, is, is then the call setup. And here we, we see that traditionally some, some kind of average numbers for, for 2G, 3G system, call setup times around six, six uh, seconds. That's really what we, we have to beat when it comes to, to uh, Volta. And you have a number of, 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 of different um, charts put, looking then to, to see, depending on what state the device would be in. And uh, uh, on one side, you can have a, um, a device in, in, in fully connected, fully active mode. On one side, in a battery saving mode. And even then, with a not prepared device in, in, in idle mode, you talk about um, uh, call setup times around two to three seconds and, and extremely fast when you have, have um, uh, two devices in, in connected mode. So, so, Looking at all, all in all the, the different measurements, of course, st still improvements to be done. We really see that, that, that Volt uh, and, uh, is, is, is going then to, to, to meet the technology potential and the hopes that, that, that we have um, put to it. And this is really, as I said, things, uh, measurements being done in, in real networks in, and in, in field trials. So, Coming up to the, the last slide, a little bit of, of um, uh, summing up. Um, realization is really starting to happen. Of course, there's, there's a process to, to, uh, to, uh, to coming to launch, but the, the deployments, as I said, happening from, from next year. And uh, really see, see a good momentum in the industry overall, active dialogue when it comes to, to device players, operators, network vendors. Um, and the technology efficiency and, and end user experience, really the te technology potential is, is, is something that we are, we are able to, to, to prove and, and, and really differentiate the service around. Uh, Volta 
is not only doing voice, it's really a, a combined starting point to see a line and, and work for interoperability, but it has a great potential in, in adding video capabilities, other multimedia capabilities into the offering and, and to a, a competitive um, bundle from the operator point of view. And stressing then, ag again, putting together a full system, managing it from a total end-to-end uh, -end perspective, looking carefully at the, the, the KPIs and all the optimization that needs to be done. And uh, I think that's, that really sum summarizes what our main messages from Ericsson. Great. Thank, thank you, Stefan. Um, thank you. Did, did I hear you right that there's a six second, um, or was it six milliseconds in setup of the call? Is it actually six I, seconds? Yeah, in 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 in, in a normal uh, kind kind of uh, average call, just just clock it the next time you do a, a, a normal uh, phone call, and you will probably experience something in that range. Oh my God, I didn't realize it was that bad. You know, I I, I um. Uh, I know uh, in in the very first days of MCI, uh, it was two minutes for the setup uh, on their on their phone network. So uh, no, I, I, I recognize that we've got an order of magnitude better here, but but it's yeah, still you you, you sure do. So 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 you you you're invited to our labs, and you can really see that that it 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 is a difference, even though you might not notice it on on in your everyday life. Then right, uh, I um. It, it made me wonder, you know, when, when we did voice over LT, when we did voice over IP, uh, we actually had to make it so that the phone generated the sound of dial tone itself, just to make it so people knew that they were connected, right? And 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 wireless doesn't work that way, right? You just press send. But now I'm sitting there saying, well, maybe we're going to bring back the sound of dial tone to, to wireless. We'll see. Let's move on. Yeah, that's it. thank you. Go ahead, gang. Uh, are are you there? Yes. Okay. Let's, Gang Wu from Intel, please continue. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for attending this uh, webinar, and uh, thank you, uh, MTC, for offering this opportunity. So, I will talk about uh, uh, the uh, from uh, Intel's perspective uh, how we see uh, VLT and uh, its role. Uh, in the future of the telecommunication and information society. Next page, please. Okay, so the world is, uh, is increasingly connected. And uh, as we speak today, Intel's platform is powering the uh, communication, telecommunication uh, networks uh, around the world uh, uh, from the data center to application server to gateways to uh, radio access network nodes and uh, the user devices. That include uh, the fixed, uh, nomadic, and the mobile terminals. So one thing interesting is that uh, LTE significantly increased uh, users' data bandwidth, provides uh, new potentials for the new application. On the other hand, is also raise uh, users' expectations. And uh, um, we can... Um, I'm sorry, someone is typing on the keyboard right now very loudly. It would be great if you can uh, mute yourself, please. Please continue. Okay, thank you. So we can certainly expect that uh, LT Advanced will further push the envelope, enabling new innovative service and applications and uh, a greater user experience with uh, new technologies uh, such as uh, carrier aggregation. However, a major issue uh, that we uh, hear from the uh, the market and our con uh, customers is that uh, uh, the the is uh, the experience is uh, clearly fragmented, and there's a lack of uh, service consistency. And in addition, as the network evolving into heterogeneous networks we can expect the more challenges and the raise the customer expectations. Next page, please. So Intel's goal is to, uh, the, the ultimate goal is to improve user experience. 
that actually include uh, consistency and uh, the uh, service availability and the cost and the power consumption. We need to reduce that. Uh, we also need a framework for new service and ap application introductions to add the new values and the revenue for the uh, con consumers and the uh, operators. And also, the new p uh, framework uh, has to uh, enable the future heterogeneous networks deployment and uh, uh, also enable the uh, future uh, multi-com, we, we call it a multi-com at Intel, basically different type of air interfaces working together and having consistent, consistent service offering. Next page, please. So Intel sees the VOIT, VOIT uh, offers an attractive off, uh, offering. Uh, is uh, the first mainstream application for IMS, and it's a part of a feature-rich platform that uh, uh, br not only bridges the past uh, with the future, but also with uh, uh, expansion, uh, future expansion and future-proof technology. Uh, it was uh, systematically uh, designed and thoroughly designed from a requirements point of view, from a interoperability, uh, backward compatibility, and also from service and revenue generation point of view. And also, uh, it was a highly optimized over the data plan for uh, the best quality of service delivery over a IP uh, network infrastructure. And uh, there's a lot of consideration put in uh, in the interface for power saving uh, and uh, cost reduction. Another thing we found uh, VOLT uh, attractive is that uh, it is, uh, can operate across many types of devices. And uh, also it's a standards based and the potential for larger scale uh, global deployment and application. However, having said so, we also recognize that uh, there are still uh, quite a number of challenges. Uh, for VOLT, uh, for example, uh, it is a highly complex uh, and with uh, many uh, specifications. On this page, I list uh, just a few. And uh, if you look at uh, GSMA uh, IR.92 uh, documents, there's a long list of specifications. So as a result, integration and IoT is, uh, from a practical point of view, a, a gating factor in the uh, VOIT's success. And from the past or past experience, user experience cannot be guaranteed by uh, and delivered by just one or two companies. It is, uh, requires the whole ecosystem working together. Next page, please. Now, the challenge for the ecosystem is how to make it happen. Uh, we are certainly dealing, as I mentioned earlier, we are certainly dealing with a complex network. And uh, the picture shows uh, there are uh, many elements involved in, in this network. And, uh, uh, and it will only become more complex as we introduce heterogeneous network uh, deployment concept. We need a rigorous test process and the ecosystem collaboration. And we see IMTC a very good initiative to help achieving the goal. To summarize, from Intel's perspective, VOLT is a good starting point for the next generation technology innovation. A uh, lot of work still need to be done. And for example, uh, the uh, Dan mentioned the roaming that still need to be completed. And more importantly, integration and the testing process is key. And the ecosystem must continue its current progress in VGPP, GSMA, and now MTC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Gang. I, um, I appreciate that. I, I, I've got questions for you, but I'm going to hold them to the end so that we can get to Anatoly. 
and talk about how we see things moving forward. So Anatoly, welcome. Thank you, Carl. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for attending uh, our webinar. So I, I'm essentially, right now, I'm more or less a uh, talking head because uh, uh, Tahi uh, Levent Levy was supposed to speak on behalf of Red Vision and also IMTC IMS Activity Group, uh, but uh, he unfortunately he could not join us. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak um, well for myself, but uh, really on his behalf. Um, so um, in essence, um, uh, and I, I'm gonna be. As I as I have to do in a lot of my presentations, I'll I'll, I'll have to constantly twist the hat uh, left right back and forth because I'm uh, going to be between Red Vision and IMTC. But really, um, the the way we see things, uh, the way Red Vision uh, sees things, is pretty much very aligned with the whole IMTC vision. Uh, the Im implementations uh, are not the same as standards, and this is why. Uh, IMTC exists in the first place, uh, but uh, most importantly uh, for Red Vision, for us as a company, um, um, this was uh, always extremely important. Uh, it, it doesn't matter that you have a standards-based implementation. It doesn't mean that um, um, interoperability will be achieved just by the just by the virtue of fact that uh, your in, uh, implementation is standards-based. Uh, there are there are always issues which need to be um, worked on uh, in the signal capabilities and media and the overall uh, alignment of the technologies. There are, there are always uh, issues to work on. So um, if we look at um, uh, you've heard a lot. You uh, Dan Dan Warren gave us an ex excellent introduction into where voice or LTE is, where it's going. Uh, and but if you look at um, the overall process uh, of what, what um, how standardization works, so we start from the specification that exists today. Uh, we got IR92. We got uh, as as some of them were new to me today, uh, like IR58. IR uh, I heard about IR94. So there is a whole bunch of other specifications coming into the play that will be all important. Um, so but. And uh, here they, they come from GSMA. Um, and then uh, once we have those uh, specifications, then, well, what we can do, we can get our uh, uh, R&D departments, uh, get them to work and uh, get them to implement. Uh, and uh, so once once this is done, once you go through the uh, R&D process, uh, you got something you can now play with. Right. So now you uh, first, of course, you do in the internal testing. You want to make sure the software works. Uh, it works on the proper devices. Everything is uh, great, at least um, for your uh, internal uh, needs. Uh, but then, then, so technically, you have something which is working. But now that's the real time. Uh, really, it's time to make things to work. So. Uh, th this is where you get to the phase of the interoperability testing, and uh, this is what uh, IMTC is um, uh, essentially doing since um, 1992. Interestingly enough, the organization will be 20 years old next year, um, and uh, and in essence, uh, there are a whole bunch of different areas: uh, video, uh, communications, and so on and so on. Uh, we, we we always were IMTC as an organization was focused on uh, video, but we we always done all kinds of voice over IP, streaming, um, really everything. Um, uh, 3G, c 24 m which is mobile video, a lot of different uh, work was done uh, always in IMTC, and uh, the latest one was uh, is a voice over LTE process, which is done in the, our IMS activity group. Uh, and uh, in essence, um, uh, I Unfortunately, I, I only uh, saw it um, when Dan was presenting his slides uh, when he mentioned the IMTC SuperOp, which was the last um, uh, interoperability testing event, which took place uh, in May of this year. Uh, and uh, we, we we did have handsets. We had uh, voice over LTE handsets from uh, SC Ericsson. We did have uh, voice over uh, LTE uh, handset uh, from. Um, uh, from Samsung, uh, and we had uh, 
uh, a soft client from uh, Intel. So I would not say that we didn't have voice royalty handsets and, uh, and and most importantly, all those handsets had been deployed on a live uh, on a live uh, voice royalty core, which was provided by Huawei. So uh, in essence, we, we did we did testing, we tested voice calls, we testing uh, tested functionalities such as transfer and so on. So this was. Um, and uh, uh, th this was all working, and uh, th uh, and again, this is what uh, IMTC does. We we really do uh, interoperability testing um, for for a lot of different technologies. And so, once you pass through the interoperability testing, uh, not even pass, but uh, from the outcome of the interoperability testing, now becomes an input into certification process because this is what carriers want when they are going to carry a device. They they want to know that uh, this device is going to be uh, uh, not only standards compliant, but uh, it is important that it will perform under. Uh, Whatever circumstances are, so this is uh, this is where organizations like Global Certification Forum comes to play, which uh, define the process. They define the process of certification, and they conduct certification testing. It is um, I, I would like to uh, stress that uh, IMTC doesn't do anything with certification. We do interoperability testing. We develop test plans and do into, uh, just a, a uh, interoperability testing. Um, uh, and then uh, GCF is uh, that, that's totally separate process. Certification is different from interoperability, of course. Um, and uh, so, and and in essence, uh, just uh, here is the few more bullet points. Um, so we we implement test specification, and then we conduct uh, events. Uh, we conduct face-to-face -face events uh, when uh, when all the vendors get together and uh, test their implementations, and then. Based on the results of those uh, that testing, uh, there are effectively there are a few possible outcomes. One outcome of such an interoperability testing is, uh, of course, the enhancements in um, the product. Not even enhancements, but you, you're really making your product interoperable. Uh, what else is happening is that sometimes specification has issues. So those issues, uh, IMTC has ongoing relationship with. Uh, uh, all the standards defining organizations, uh, GSMA, 3GPP, ITUT, uh, IETF, and and so on. So uh, every time we, we have a need, we, we see um, provide a feedback. We always can do it. We, we've done it on uh, numerous number of occasions. We um, there was an interesting dialogue about call setup time. So um, I'm not sure if we're at that point yet, but uh, and that that might be. Um, a little bit outside of our realm, but uh, I can tell you that um, uh, when the uh, mobile video telephony was popular on this, uh, based on the 3G C24M protocol, uh, based on IMTC work, uh, the call setup time was improved from um, the, I believe the initial call setup time was uh, uh, almost closing to the 20 seconds. We, we managed to get it to under two seconds. So uh, by uh, and, and that was all based on the practical work done in the IMTC uh, activity group. Uh, and um, the, the important thing, what, why why uh, what IMTC uh, does is working well, is because uh, our interoperability testing events, they, they're really engineering events. The, 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 most of the operations of the consortium is really, is, it, it's, it's engineering. We, we have engineers uh, working in um, uh, in the activity groups, building the test plans, uh, and uh, and then we have the same engineers uh, coming together and test their implementations. There are no marketing folks. There are no, um, uh, of course, there is no sales. That's needless to say. But 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 really, it's all engineering events. Engineers, uh, there are rules of engagement which guarantees that everything which is happening is stays private. Uh, within that testing room, and uh, therefore engineers can work in an open environment, and they can effectively uh, doesn't matter that the companies are fierce competitors, but uh, engineers can work together, and uh, engineers can um, um, so solve issues. This uh, th this is uh, this is really a great benefit. So, and uh, th so th this is, that's that's what makes uh, IMTC somewhat of a unique place. Um, so, 
And uh, uh, now going back to the Rod Vision as a software vendor, uh, we, we uh, what we do is, of course, we implement. We have uh, a lot of different products uh, which uh, support voice over LTE implementation. We have different IMS clients. Uh, we have uh, we, uh, our uh, our toolkit products uh, like SIP toolkit, which is uh, supporting uh, f it's fully IMS compliant, and uh, of course it's. Uh, Supporting the voice over LTE imp uh, implementation, we have video clients and uh, w which also voice over LTE compliant. This is all done in the um, uh, R and D, of course, and uh, the, those products come through the QA and then they uh, become part of uh, uh, something which has been implemented uh, uh, by our uh, customers. So this is uh, so that's uh, that's that, that's our focus as a software vendor and. With that, I really, here's the contact information for IMTC. And uh, with that, I really would like to thank everyone for their attention. Uh, we, we're done with like formal part of presentation. And uh, in our Skype channel, I saw Carl uh, vigorously talking to uh, I don't know how many people. But uh, we definitely got some questions. So uh, it would be great if all the speakers will uh, Unmute themselves, and uh, you can de definitely speakers. Please use video. Uh, and uh, Carl, uh, take it take it forward. Thank you, Anatoly, and, and great job. And thank you for organizing this. And, and uh, I, it, it's been a great learning curve for me. And I, I think I know a lot about this stuff. So um, we've got a few questions. One of them that uh, came about was. Um, how does the setup time compare to over-the-top VoIP calls? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Has anybody been actually paying attention to uh, um, uh, looking underneath uh, the, pro the uh, Skype protocols or Google Talk and what, what the normal setup time is for these things? I would think they're much less, but I think that's because of the fact that there's much less signaling involved in end-to-end. -end. I don't have a, a, a benchmark on, on that, but I think the, the really the strong point is uh, when we talk about the, the um, um, setup for, for Vault is that we have a controlled flow uh, through, throughout the network. So, so when it comes to, to the reliability aspects and so on of, of actually succeeding during the call setup, having it extremely fast, uh, that, that's really the big advantage as I see it. Yeah, I, th I think an apples to apples comparison would have to be something other than an internal Google Talk or an internal Skype or an internal iChat. It have to be like the um, the Skype for mobile that Verizon implemented with RCS to get a good handle on that, on how that signaling works. But now for sure, the the the, the, the um, uh, ex experience is basically an an instant setup, and that's 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 really the the, the good part around it. So. Now, I love it when acronyms come in that I don't know. So uh, I'll, I'll ask Anatoly to start me off answering this because he'll probably know the acronym. What is the lowest QCI needed to support acceptable vo voice over LTE for instant latency requirement? Uh, QCI? <laughs> QCI. I uh, have no idea. This is some kind of uh, okay. Now it's from QCI, Carl. Now it's becoming the CQI. CQI. So it's something quality indicator. I'm assuming. Call quality but, uh, indicator. My guess would be call quality. Excellent. So now we figure out the acronym. I still don't have an answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I I so, think the acceptable latency for any phone call is uh, what uh, about 200 milliseconds. That's uh, technically considered acceptable. Yeah, well, let's, let's just wax speculative here. As we go to HD, does that change any of the parameters at all? Does it make it so that latency has to uh, has to be better because of the fact that we've got um, uh, deeper samples or packets are packets and UDP is UDP and we're okay? I, I, if, if I can just give, give a comment on, on, on the quality, I think we, we are talking about a little bit uh, of the framework of having um, uh, being speech path delay below 200 millisecond and, and a, a frame error rate uh, below 
one percent, and I think what 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 we have indicated and and I got from from test is uh, independent of of bad radio and load. We are we are getting frame uh, error rates some uh, zero point two uh, percent, and 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 then we have the speech path delays in 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 the uh, area of of two hundred milliseconds. So. I, so I, I, I don't know exactly what, what, what the question was aiming at, but that, that's, that's a little bit of some of the parameters involved in, in, in uh, ensuring good quality. Okay. okay. May, may, Go ahead. Uh, Carl, may I add, uh, yeah. add uh, some comments? So this is Gong Wu from uh, Intel. So CQI uh, is uh, basically the channel feedback and uh, the, uh, it's actually dictated the uh, data rates uh, on the physical layer. So uh, I think the uh, um, the uh, oh sorry that's, that's the EPS. Uh, okay, no, I I'm I'm actually talking about something different. So that's the uh, QS class uh, identifier, and uh, oh okay, now we are actually coming back to QCI. Sorry. <laughs> so I was answering CQI <laughs> question, and then the question actually turned back to uh, uh, QCI. Uh. Uh, so QCI, that's uh, really guaranteed, uh, you, you basically have a guaranteed, uh, uh, I have to check back the specifications, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, there, there is uh, a, uh, there's a level that uh, we need to, uh, for, uh, for voice services. Essentially, it's, uh, it's a, the uh, very high uh, class, basically. Okay. Um. I asked Pat if he's got any insight himself into this. Um, okay, I'm not sure whether it was you or Anatoly who mentioned um, a uh, Samsung Ericsson implementation uh, for the uh, uh, that basically had the both client and the question is was was both implemented on the client side in Silicon or was it from an IMS client software implementation? And I'm, I, Those were and definitely handsets. Those were handsets which were used in uh, in the testing. And were they silicon based, or were they, or were you in effect? Uh, they actual, they, they actual handsets like this. Not of course, not not this device, but uh, exact handsets. Okay, so the silicon, yeah, silicon was based. already implemented. Yeah, silicon, silicon based. Yes. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, so do we have a rollout schedule? Like, do we know? Um, well, let's ha let's ask uh, let let's ask our panel with with silicon involved. Uh, Manuel, the handsets that you guys uh, provided are they going to be commercially available, or did you build them just for um, the testing purposes? Uh, there are already. Um, okay, uh, we're talking about uh, tablets, right? Not handsets. Well, voice over LTE, I'll available. take it in any format. I will, I would love okay. to have a bit a tablet. I'm fine with uh, that. We, um, I cannot provide a detailed answer, but uh, I know we have IMS clients working on our devices. Hence, on an IMS LTE implementation, we should be able to, to provide VOLTE. Okay. Okay. Um, gang, and just out of curiosity, is Intel uh, implementing this in the A4? Or are we, should I expect that all atoms are... Uh, uh, going to be uh, voice over LTE capable, regardless of uh, who's who's uh, making them. Is uh, is uh, in the baseband uh, chipset, so it's not. Uh, so in other words, uh, uh, really the optimizations include uh, uh, three parts. We are actually working on all of them. One is the control plan. Basically, we offer the uh, base station, the server platform that. Uh, with the virtualization that uh, speed up uh, the signaling uh, control plan process. Uh, there's another one that's uh, the uh, uh, the uh, data plan optimization for voice quality uh, guarantee, and uh, that's uh, that's the part uh, we are doing across the application processor and also the uh, the baseband. Then there's the silicon support in the in the baseband chipset, and that's also something we we're working on. Got it, got it. Uh, and uh, Stefan, uh, I know that that's normally done by that Sony Ericsson crowd, so it may be that you're not privileged to what's going on on the chipsets, but have you got any insight? Uh, 
No, uh, yeah, I mean you're right. When it comes to to participation in 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 the IMTC event, it 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 was then the the uh, ST Ericsson. Uh, but but of course we are we are involved when it comes to to on one side uh, uh, testing the radio aspects of of, of modern products, do, doing that the IoT uh, IoT labs towards our radio, and then we do the the uh, the client the application part in in uh, to, uh, towards our IMS applications, and then we put it together into the uh, the end-to-end -end setup. So so we are of course involved, but 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 not responsible for it, if you like. Got it, got it. So, so, uh, so Pat Scanlon has uh, has admitted knowledge about about the whole QCI question in case in case anyone can't see it because they're on audio. And he says most over the top is best effort today, but jitter free voice might demand highest QCI class. Acceptable quality might be achievable with QCI with less rigorous demand. I understand that LTE's goal is 10 milliseconds uh, latency. For the user plane, which is fine for voice quality at its highest level. So, so um, he he definitely should be invited to speak at the next event. Yes, I, I he's a ringer. Uh, we we need to we need to get him involved. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Uh, we we had a whole bunch of uh, discussion with uh, Mr. Good here. Let's just see if there's there's some there's questions some that we should implement. That we should implement. Um, Actually, there was one thing that was kind of interesting, which I, I'd like everybody to just talk about in general. Uh, here's my perspective, and you guys can tell me I'm absolutely wrong. But as we move to LTE, my assumption is that we're going to get less radios, not more, on the, net, on the devices, and therefore battery life will improve. So the question was kind of a general rant about Comparing voice of 2G, 3G, which solution will help optimize end users' experience on LTE voice, especially the improvement based on um, computing power per talk second, current consumption per talk second, battery efficiency, billing per second, spectrum usage, and call specific responses. So there was all this long winded stuff that basically said, you know, are we basically making it so that uh, I can only have a five minute phone call and then I need to recharge? So anybody want to talk about what their expectation is as we move to LTE as to what the uh, impact is to the device Carl, in general yeah. and battery life? Carl, I can address that, but I think we should look at end-to-end. -end. And let's look at the devices for a second. I, I'm sure Intel can go much deeper in the CPU and, and the components. But if you look at the device, the software running on it, especially it's over the top applications and so on, uh, is based on using again and again and again the same uh, network services such as presence, location, and so on. So uh, something we didn't talk today about, and it's at the higher level, is the rich communications uh, suite in, uh, initiative by SMA, RCS. We need to look at the device at the operating system level uh, and start to look on how we optimize these functions. Not if I've ever heard of CPU. Uh, th this, is, uh, this is my view, and we're discussing that quite a lot internally at Huawei. Uh, I'll turn over to you. You muted. Carl, you muted. Carl. Good. Carl, you're muted. Uh, gang, have you, <laughs> have you got any thoughts on the Intel yeah. side? Are you guys sitting there saying, saying, you know, holy cow, look how much power I'm saving because I don't have all these stupid radios? Well, uh, here's uh, the uh, situation. Uh, basically, if you look at uh, the uh, mobile uh, platform, uh, the biggest uh, uh, power consumption uh, source for power consumption actually is the display. So the, uh, the display, that's the biggest one. And then you have a whole a bunch of uh, signaling going on and uh, for example messaging and you basically keep uh, waking up uh, the uh, radio and uh, the application uh, processor and uh, that's uh, that's another uh, that's another source it depends on how much optimization we do uh, together with uh, uh, folks like Huawei and uh, and uh, and uh, Ericsson we, we we actually can manage that part 
And then there's uh, really the radio itself. The radio itself, actually, with the silicon process uh, continue to improve, uh, is actually becoming less and less an issue. I'm not saying it's not an issue, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, just naturally going down. And uh, so far, at this point, uh, that's not the main uh, main uh, problem uh, from a power consumption point. Sorry, so are you saying that software-defined radios are, are going to make it so that all these issues kind of become... Uh, Software-defined radio is uh, probably not. Uh, uh, we continue, uh, we expect to continue to see on the device side to be hardened design. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, ASIC. And the reason is that uh, uh, the user's expectation and uh, requirements are actually going up. Even every time we our silicon improves, we actually have the, uh, uh, we actually have this uh, uh, have this uh, 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 the uh, have this uh, head room basically moved to uh, uh, to the application to run application to improve user uh, experience and to offer new capabilities. And on the base station side, uh, we we basically see that is 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 a soft is becoming soft and softer. Got it. Uh, and. Uh, if, Carl, if I can just can add, and, and I think also in in the definition of of, of uh, the Volt uh, profile, the R92, I think it was was a really good move to to mandate already from day one uh, DRX in order to to improve the battery lifetime. So so looking at the voice aspects, you 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 have mandated functionality in order to to get uh, superior lifetime. Okay, so I kind. Of I kind of oh man, um, boy. Um, Pat sent us a, a note about the exact standards um, uh, on Q, on QCI. Um, yeah, we we definitely have to get him to come out and talk in the future, Anatoly. Um, um, sure. Here, here's let me uh, end this this with a very interesting question for you. Uh, back when I was in, involved in, in coming up with the uh, the internet strategy for a major carrier on, or main anonymous, um, but we're in their footprint right now. Um, it was uh, the backbone looked like it was important, and there were all these ISPs in this world. Now you look, and most people are getting their services from the major carriers. What is our expectation for over the top folks like? Skype, like Google Talk, like iChat, like for for it could be broad, it could be BlackBerry Messenger. Do we expect that the carriers are going to regain control over our over-the-top experiences, or do we expect that they're going to interconnect, or do we expect that the two worlds will basically coexist in different ways? Anybody want to be the lead to answer that question? Um. They, I think they will coexist. It's um, it's too difficult at this point to um, uh, the merging them is not not in the books uh, right now. And uh, and uh, the interesting thing is um, the way I see the the generation which is uh, really using those. Um, they they used to the idea that they have to use uh, different tools for different purposes. So they'll use one messenger type for one group of friends and uh, uh, then another type of communication uh, platform to talk to the other friends. Uh, like my son is um, 13 years old. He's uh, using Skype uh, when he's doing one kind of activity, then he's doing the FaceTime at the other time. I mean, he, he he really doesn't care. I mean, so I I expect that this um, uh, trying to put it all together will be uh, difficult, if not impossible. But, uh, I'm sure there are other opinions here. Are there other opinions? I I share the view that that for sure there will be 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 a combination, but uh, in, to large degree, I uh, I believe that that it's it's um, about creating a competitive service bundle, and there you need to to on one side perhaps have control of the really important stuff and add uh, additional components, additional services in from other directions. So 
no 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 isolated island, but at the same time perhaps uh, see what is 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 uh, dear to control. Gang, you have any thoughts on this? Uh, no further addition. Okay, and uh, Manuel, we, we saved the best for last. You're you're you were speaking about RCS. What do you think the future is? Uh, if we look at the ecosystem, again, coming from an end-to-end -end approach and coming from the terminal side, I'm uh, uh, seeing the terminals becoming more like uh, general purpose devices like laptops and uh, tablets and so on. I cannot see how carriers will continue to exercise control over such a multitude of devices and functions. And I agree with my colleagues. We have to start to look at the value add. The value add is the quality of service. Uh, one thing we uh, we talked is RCS, but the other thing is why service providers are called service providers because they offer 24/7 support, they offer uh, billing support, and all this. Um, who called the Skype support line and got a live person answering the call? Um, have anybody experienced that with Skype yet? No, not um, yet. Although I, I do call call some of them directly, but that's a different issue. I have to. I sometimes they can't hear me on Skype. But but how often do you need to call Skype for support? True enough. I th I think uh, it it'll be interesting to see if we get a Vault implementation like Skype for mobile that Verizon did. Um, you know it it would be. Um, a fun way for people to work, but I think, uh, and I think um, uh, Manuel's got it right that the question really is, what's our device of the future? Um, you know, I, I I have my tablet here, I've got my computer here, and I got my phone here. You know, one day I expect that uh, I'm going to choose one and not carry all three. So, uh, you know, I'm supposed to be a wireless expert, but mostly I'm a guy who knows how to find power cords. Anyway, with that said, I want to thank the panel. Uh, I want to thank Manuel Vexler from Huawei, Stefan Svensson from Ericsson, uh, Gangwu from Intel, Anatoly Levine from Radvision, and of course Dan Warren, who uh, had to run away from us from the GSMA. Uh, please remember that this is available for um, for viewing after this call and share it with the people who are interested. And if you have um, devices or are participating in any way, shape, or form with the network of the future, uh, consider working with the IMPC to make it so that you're interoperable with the rest of us. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Carl. Thank, Thank you, you Carl. All.